Our gospel reading this morning comes to us from Matthew's gospel, the fifth chapter. Jesus is continuing here the Sermon on the Mount. Listen now for the word of the Lord. You are the salt of the earth. But if salt has lost its taste, how can its saltiness be restored? It is no longer good for anything, but is thrown out and trampled underfoot. You are the light of the world. A city built on a hill cannot be hid. No one, after lighting a lamp, puts it under the bushel basket, but on the lampstand, and it gives light to all in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before others so that they may see your good works and give glory to your Father in heaven. Do not think that I have come to abolish the law or the prophets. I have come not to abolish, but to fulfill. For truly I tell you, until heaven and earth pass away, not one letter, not one stroke of a letter will pass from the law until all is accomplished. Therefore, whoever breaks one of the least of these commandments and teaches others to do the same will be called least in the kingdom of heaven. But whoever does them and teaches them will be called great in the kingdom of heaven. For I tell you, unless your righteousness exceeds that of the scribes and the Pharisees, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. And so Jesus continues today the Sermon on the Mount. We began reading the Sermon on the Mount two weeks ago with the Beatitudes. The Sermon on the Mount is Jesus' great proclamation, his great sermon. When God becomes human, enters into earthly existence with us, one would imagine that God would have something to say. This is God's address to humanity. The Sermon on the Mount. So what does God say? He's got a, an audience, even down to us today. What does God tell us? What does God expect from us? When God becomes human to be able to talk to us, we would expect what he has to say is very important. And it is. It is important, but I'm not sure it's very clear. You are the salt of the earth, but if salt has lost its taste, you are light, no one puts a light under the bushel basket. Okay, maybe, maybe we can follow that. But then it starts getting a little confusing. At least I think it is. Do not think I've come to abolish the law of the prophets. I came not to abolish, but to fulfill. Not one letter, not one stroke of a letter will pass. Okay, that seems to be clear enough. Did you catch verse 19, though? Therefore, whoever breaks one of the least of these commandments and teaches others to do the same will be called least in the kingdom of heaven. So we can break the law and make it into the kingdom of heaven. Maybe we'll be the least, but at least we're there, right? So you're saying there's a chance? What is Jesus saying? I mean, for most of us, I think we'd have to acknowledge we cannot keep to God's law in the Old Testament perfectly. And then when Jesus comes and he tells us that even just being angry with a brother or sister makes you a murderer, well, then we know we have no chance of living out the law perfectly, right? What does he expect from us? What is he trying to tell us? I mean, and are we ready to hear what he has to say? Sometimes when I read scripture like this, I feel a little bit like the late, great Phil Hartman's character on Saturday Night Live, Johnny O'Connor. You remember him? 
He's an actor from the 40s, and he's just been told that he is fired. You're finished, Johnny. Don't mince words. I think you stink. Listen, Harry, if you're unha unhappy with my work, tell me now. You're through. Do you hear me? Through. You'll never work in this town again. Don't leave me hanging by a thread. Let me know how I stand. I think you're the worst actor I've ever seen, and I get 500 letters a day telling me the same. What's the word on the street? It's good stuff, but Johnny says he wants it straight, but he doesn't really want it straight. Not really. And, and meanwhile, the conversation is happening on two different levels. They're missing each other. And I often think that's the case with Jesus and his followers. What do you mean I have to be born again? How can I come from my mother a second time? What is this bread from heaven, Jesus? Give it to us always. If that's true, then wash not only my feet, but my hands and head as well. Yeah, the people around Jesus, they often don't seem to get it, at least not at first. I mean, what do you expect when they're human, when we're human, and he's God? The great theologian uh, St. Augustine said, if you have understood, then it is not God. <laughs> if you have understood, then it is not God. So how can we understand what Jesus is trying to tell us here? Because it seems mightily important, doesn't it? He's talking about who gets into the kingdom of heaven. That seems to be of vital importance. And what seems confusing is this back and forth between whether we have to keep the law or not. What are God's expectations for us? By the law, we're talking about the religious law in the Old Testament here beginning with the Ten Commandments, but expanded beyond that into hundreds and, and, and eventually thousands of laws that we're expected to keep. Does God expect us to really keep them? And then we get the, the, the thread of grace throughout Scripture that, well, because of what Jesus has done for us, we, we have God's grace and don't need the law. And then Jesus says, but I've come not to abolish the law, yet to fulfill it. To begin to untangle this, we have to remind ourselves of something that we say from time to time, is that to interpret any scripture, right, we interpret any scripture in the light of all scripture. That is, we don't take out a, a verse or a section of the Bible and lift this up and say, see, it's right here, it's very simple. We have to look at what all of the Bible is telling us so that we begin to make sense of it, right? And so when we read passages that seem to tell us that, that God has God law, God's laws, they're very clear what we can and can't do, we have to live by them, right? We have to remember that there are also passages of grace in the Scripture where God says all things are possible with God, right? Because of the grace of Jesus Christ we can be forgiven and set free. But then when we read passages that are grace-filled, we have to remember, too, that grace is not cheap, that there are things that God is trying to teach us and expect from us and hope for us. And that just anything doesn't go either. Now, the, the law won't save us in and of itself. Paul says that the law serves the purpose, actually, of condemning us, of, of showing us how we can't live up to God's standards. But it's interesting. Because when it comes down to it, when Jesus is given the opportunity to condemn others, he frequently refuses to do so. There was a woman famously caught breaking the law, sinning. Brought before Jesus, you remember this famous passage, he said, let the one without sin cast the first stone, right? You remember that. Do you remember what happens after that when he looks down and everybody walks away? What does he say? 
Is there no one here to condemn you? Neither do I condemn you. Go and sin no more. I think that's the key. And I want you to hear this. Because this may be the thread that will unravel the whole thing and make sense of it. We human beings have to be seen and loved to be set free. And we are. We have to be seen for who we are and loved for who we are to be set free. And we are. John 8 says, if the Son sets you free, then you are free indeed. And Jesus is talking in his Sermon on the Mount to a lot of people who have a lot of reasons to think badly about themselves. These are people who've been trampled by the world, maybe not all of them, but a lot of them. He's talking to common, ordinary people, people who live in a difficult time, in a difficult place, and have difficult lives. And while ultimately their outward circumstances are probably very different from ours, we probably often feel the same. We probably often compare ourselves to others and feel ourselves worse for it. We probably often think about all the things that we get wrong, more so than the wonderful things that we often do to help people or encourage them. We can relate to the poor in spirit that Jesus is speaking to. We can relate to those who hunger and thirst for righteousness in a world where things still aren't the way that we wish they would be. We can relate, perhaps, even to the meek or to those who are mourning. Jesus is speaking to these crowds of people, and people who probably don't have much reason to think highly of themselves. And he tells them they're blessed. Over and over and over again, he blesses them. He tells them they are blessed. And when he's done telling them they are blessed, he calls them salt and light. The salt of the earth. That's the best salt. Not the salt from the sea. The salt you have to go work hard and mine in the ground for. Yeah. He calls them that. You know, in most of our churches, we spend a lot of time trying to figure out what we must do to appease God. What we must do to make it into heaven. Especially, you know, heaven after this life is over. And in a lot of churches, you might get different answers, depending on which church you go to. You might get, well, you've got to, you've got to feed the hungry and clothe the naked. And it's true, Jesus talked about that a lot, famously in Matthew 25, the sheep and the goats. In other churches, you might get an answer like, well, you have to say a certain prayer in a certain way, and you have to have the right kind of feeling in your heart when you say it. That's all fine and good. And I'm not devaluing any of those things our prayer life, or our active life. But let's back up a minute. And, not, and acknowledge that Jesus sees you as you are right now and calls you salt and light. Let's back up a minute, and before we even think about what we have to do, Acknowledge that Jesus sees you. You know, I saw a sign this week. We were at a store, and there was a a, a sign there with a a, a common depiction of Jesus, and on the bottom it says, I saw that. I don't really think that's what Jesus is like, do you? But he does see us. He sees you right now and loves you. He sees you at your worst, and he sees you at your best, and he knows that that best is still not good enough. 
and loves you anyway. And he calls you salt and light along with this crowd. And look, verse 19 in this passage where Jesus says, you know, if, if you break the law, you'll be the least in the kingdom of heaven, that seems to indicate to me this is not a formula or a recipe for making it into heaven when we die. But maybe it is an instruction on how to bring the kingdom of heaven to earth. You see, in Matthew's gospel, the one of the primary roles of the Messiah was to bring the kingdom of heaven to earth. And I think that's one of the reasons why we and God are on these different levels when we're talking to each other because we're asking a different question than God is answering. Just maybe Jesus is trying to teach us how to bring about the kingdom of heaven on earth. Look, heaven in the next life is granted if you believe in Jesus Christ. It's assured if you have faith in Jesus Christ. We've been told that over and over again in the scriptures. But what about the work of helping, of, of, of participating with God who wants to bring the kingdom of heaven to earth? That's a different story. If we're given a life of eternity in heaven, we have to work to bring about the kingdom of heaven here. Hang with me for another minute here. Because that part's the hard part. How do we change the world? It's like Miss Selena said, we, we feel small. Just this small little grain of salt, tiny little night light with one little AAA battery powering it. How can we change the world? If you want to know how to change the world, pay attention. Look at Jesus, who maybe changed the world more than Anybody else know maybe about it, actually? Look at these people he's talking to. Looking at the, look at the huddled masses he has in front of him. And he tells them that you're salt, salt of the earth, best there is, and you're light. Don't hide that light under a bushel basket. And that's the trick. If you want to know how to change the world, here's how to do it. Empower others. What must I do, Lord? You know, we keep asking ourselves, how do we appease God? I, I, maybe we've gotten the question wrong all along. God already loves us. Maybe it's not about what we need to do and what we need to be. To simply be the salt and the light that our Lord says that we are. If we would simply be the salt and the light that he calls us, oftentimes what we would do in a given situation becomes clear. But may that always have something to do with seeing and hearing other people and loving them anyway for who they are. Just as Jesus sees and loves you. You are the salt of the earth. You are the light of the world. Let's be these things. Amen.